Wine, food, talk. NapaBroadcasting.com. Thanks for joining us here at Napa Broadcasting. Every year, Napa Valley College chooses among its top teachers to award its McPherson Distinguished Teaching Award. This year, one of the recipients of that award was Paul Wagner. Paul has been an adjunct instructor in the Viticulture and Winery Technology Program for 23 years. He's a longtime marketing executive in the wine industry, best-selling author, and it is my pleasure to welcome Paul Wagner here. Paul, thanks so much for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me here. Good to have you here. First of all, 23 years is a long time. Yeah, I started when I was 12. Yeah, there uh, you go. But uh, yeah, it is a long time, a lot of change. Well, that, that's the first thing I want to talk about is how has teaching in the whole winery viticulture area changed in 23 years? Well, the first thing that's changed is that when I used to ask my students questions about facts, they would think about it and raise their hand when they thought they knew the answer. And now they pull out their cell phone and in 20 seconds they know the answer and they raise their hand and say, ooh, ooh, I know the answer and read it off their phone. So one of the real things that's changed is just the fact that information is available all the time. Uh, and you have to teach not the memorization of information. What you have to teach is now that you have that information, what do you do with it? How do you use it? So that's a pretty big change right there. And that's a whole change in mindset as far as teaching is concerned. You're teaching concepts. You're teaching from 30,000 feet as opposed to rote memorization of of details. Right, exactly right. Yep. And the other thing is now uh, all of my students, well, most of my students either ask for my lecture notes, which of course are slides on the board, or they literally bring their cameras to the class and they take pictures of anything I write on the board that's important so they don't have to take notes. Um, I'm not sure that's as effective as actually writing it down. You know, there's some right. there's, there's some, some educational elements that to That happens in writing that's things right. down. But the fact that uh, more people seem to be involved in doing that, I, I know in years past I'd look out and realize half the students weren't taking notes. Now all of them in one way or another are taking notes. So, yeah, I, I love it. Um, uh, to me, the students are more involved and they have more access. So uh, th- when we have controversial topics, students will really research that stuff literally as we are speaking and ask me questions. Well, what about this? What about that? And they're clearly pulling this stuff off the Internet. But the fact that it it enhances the discussion, that's a good thing. But that makes it a lot more fun, arguably, for you as a teacher, <clears throat> In that you get to talk about bigger issues, bigger concepts, bigger oh, yeah. ideas, as opposed to just things they can find on their phone. Absolutely. I mean, that's that, that, that that's that's the fun of drink of doing anything at Napa Valley College. Is my, you know, as we as we say, the average age, median age in these classes is thirty, thirty five. Most of them work in the wine industry. So I am not teaching eighteen year old kids what to think. I am literally taking people who are working in the wine industry every single day. And when I tell them, here's how you ought to do it, they come right back with, well, that's not how we do it at my winery. And then the discussion starts. And you're absolutely right. That's the most fun you can have as a teacher. And what areas have you focused on as a teacher? Well, uh, I started teaching wine marketing and sales. And there have been big changes there. You know, Mm. uh, if you look back 25 years ago, uh, there were far fewer wineries in Napa, as you well know. There are, what, 700 now, and there were probably 300 back then. Uh, The focus of those wineries was much more likely to be national distribution. Today, it's much more likely to be direct-to-consumer. So that's a big change in how they approach their business. There used to be distributors back then. To be, well, at least more than one distributor, <laughs> right? right? Uh, so all of that's changed. Um, yeah, it's 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 absolutely everything. Everything is different, and yet the ultimate concept, the ultimate challenge in marketing, is how do you stand out from the crowd and yet still be recognized as a leader within the crowd? That's the challenge that every marketing campaign has to address, and the wine industry continues to do it badly, which is why I still have a job. Why does the wine industry do it badly? Uh, I always say that innovation in the wine industry is waiting for three other people to do it first and then deciding you'll do it. That's innovation. Um, they are terrified. It's a, it's a traditional industry, and most most wineries are absolutely terrified to do anything really different for fear they won't be taken seriously. And yet when you talk to consumers, the biggest single reaction you get about the wine industry is they take themselves too seriously. So, yeah. And then you look at some of the brands that have been 
stratospherically successful in the wine industry, mm -hmm. and often they're brands that don't take themselves that seriously. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you get students in there that are second or third, maybe even fourth in some cases, but second or third generation, and they see it differently, but it's somehow held back by the fact that they have all this tradition that they're bringing to it. Oh, yeah. Th those are some <laughs> of the best students to have in class because they talk about, well, what my parents did. But they're also, they are also coming to grips with the fact they know they went away to school and they talk to their friends. And their friends talk about wine really differently than people in the Napa Valley do. In fact, one of the wonderful exercises I do in class is I have everybody, uh, we identify who the target market is. And by the time I read off all of the basic descriptors of the, mm -hmm. the people who buy the most wine in America, women between 35 and 55, some college, a couple of kids, I go through the whole thing. And by the time we're done, nobody in the class is the target market. And I say, here's the problem. All of us are talking about what the target market wants, and none of us are the target market. Well, but that's true in a lot of business. Somebody once made the point that if, you know, Mattel really understood its target market, all the people that work there would, <laughs> would be, be seven nine. years old or something. <laughs> so there, yeah, there has to be a certain leap that absolutely. goes with that. Yeah, yeah. But the, but the challenge is the wine industry does talk to itself way too much. Uh, and some of those kids know that. Some of those second and third generation uh, winemaking families know that. They come back to the winery and they say, you know, when I was at college, people talked about wine a different way, and we need to think about it a little differently. So, Are you seeing more of that second and third generation? There was a sense, particularly after the recession mm -hmm. that happened several years ago, that a lot of these kids that went away that thought they were going to do something else, it was a tough time, and they wound up coming back and going into the family business. Some did, some didn't. Um, I'm not in a position to make any sort of generalizations about what's going on. But the one thing I like seeing is that when kids in winemaking families come back to the business, they generally bring some creative ideas. And that's never a bad thing because the wine industry needs all the creative ideas it can get. And the idea of coming back and running the winery just the way mom and dad did, what kid ever? wants to come back to, to, to live in their parents' house and do everything exactly the way their parents. So that's part of evolution. That's a good thing. Right. That's a good and, thing. And, and, of course, you have to do it differently to come back to your point that the distribution has changed so dramatically. Yeah. You can't do it the old way because that's there right. is no there there. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I, the way I explain it is if you make under 10,000 cases of wine a year, you, should, you can and should sell all of your wine direct to consumers. If you make a million cases of wine, you can and should get the attention of the distributor. And if you're somewhere between 10,000 cases and a million cases, you're in no man's land. You're not big enough to have leverage with the distributor. You're, you make too much wine to sell direct to consumer, and you'd better figure out what you're doing there. And, and interestingly, historically, a lot of the sort of famous, well-established wineries in the Napa Valley are in that middle ground. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a sort of winnowing out at this point, more consolidation or, or more small wineries that are 10,000 and less? That's it. You're, you're certainly seeing, yeah, and, and we've seen this in the Napa Valley, the, the, the large, famous let's say, branded wineries, seems like they get bought up on a regular basis by corporations and then sold to some other corporation and on and on and on. But the real growth has been in grape growers who own nine acres of vineyards or 16 acres of vineyards and decide they've been selling the grapes too long and they're going to make their own wine instead right. and, and really make some money, which makes everybody in the industry laugh. Uh, but at the same time, uh, look, at some of the, look at some of the most successful wineries in the Valley and that's how they started. So absolutely, uh, I see a lot of my students who are 30, 35 years old. They've been working in the industry for 10 or 15 years, and they want to start their own little brand, starting with 200 cases, but eventually grow up to something that's a real business. And I encourage them not to do it because it's a <laughs> dreadful amount of work, and it's really hard to pull it off. Mm -hmm. How do you teach particularly on the marketing side, how do you teach these, these students to be creative, to think differently, to sort of think outside, forgetting the ones that are multi-generational, but the mm. others to think outside the box? Well, actually, it's easier with them. The ones that are outside the, the winemaking families, because first of all, they don't know what you can't do. Right. And the second thing is once you define 
the goals of the project, which is you've got to stand out from the crowd, then by definition, they have to start thinking of something new. They can't say, as, as um, Liz Slater always says, I'm a small family winery. I carefully select my vineyards. I handcraft my wines, and I've won some awards. That's every winery on the planet. Now what makes you different? And by the time I'm done teaching those concepts, boy, we've had absolutely fabulous creative projects. I've had, I've had students sell the Napa Valley College wines into Trader Joe's, into Whole Foods, into Naked Wines, and they come back to class and say, hey, I just, I just got a great offer from a really serious retailer for these wines. Here's my concept. And, of course, we don't have the wines to do that. But right. the fact that they went in, first of all, that they came up with a concept. And second of all, that they had the motivation and the chutzpah to literally walk into those companies and sell them on the idea. Man, is it fun to teach students like that. And how has online sales changed all this and changed what you teach? Well, actually, online sales is a fairly small portion of the wine industry. But On, growing, yes? It yeah. is growing, but it's um, uh, th- there are t- sort of two elements to online. One of them is people who know the brand and have, and, and have connected with the brand previously. They have some r- relationship with it, and online is simply reordering. Uh, the other one is online purchases – Looking on the internet for the lowest possible price. Uh, Neither one of those is a really solid business model because the first one depends so much on making the relationship to begin with. Uh, and the second one, anytime you're you're bottom feeding, you're, it's difficult to make a living. Uh, but but online as a as a an addition to the direct to consumer, the tasting room, the events, and all the rest, that's an important part of it. And certainly the idea that uh, in a restaurant, the number of times that someone who orders or looks at a wine list, and and I hear sommeliers every single time I talk to sommeliers, they say, you know, it drives me nuts. These kids come in here and they pull out their phones and they'd rather look on their phone to learn about the wine than talk to me. Mm-hmm. And I always think, well, you should be friendlier because if you were really friendly, they'd want to talk to you. But of course, you have that problem in formal restaurants that the people presenting the food and wine feel like it's their job to educate you about everything instead of making it a little easier on you. There, there is a generational component to that as well. Somebody was Absolutely. talking the other day about uh, in, in large and small corporations, particularly with millennials, that if somebody is two cubicles down or two doors down, right. they would rather send them an email Text than them. get up and walk over to their yep. desk and solve an issue or a problem yep. in a second. Yep. Yep, absolutely. But it also means that as a winery, as someone who's selling product, you have to be accessible in that realm. Uh, you have to answer your texts. And when somebody is in a restaurant and and wants to know something about your wine, your website better not be talking about how easy it is to come and visit because that's not what they want to know. They want to know why I should buy this wine. And you need to give them some sense of the identity of the place. So it's fun. What do you teach and what do you talk about with respect to branding, their brand and the Napa Valley brand and the way in which those two things juxtapose? Well, what was it? The the old conjunctive labeling laws for the Napa Valley always said that, you know, Napa Valley always has to be biggest. Uh, It really depends on how you're selling your wine. If you're selling your wine on a national basis, Napa Valley is really important. If you're selling direct to consumer, which is what most small wineries do— the Napa Valley is almost uh, assumed, and it becomes far less important. They know they're in the Napa Valley because they're here. In fact, one of the things that I used to keep track of was the number of times I heard or read people in the Bay Area talking about going to Napa when, in fact, they were in Sonoma. Because for the Bay Area, I've heard that too. Yeah. Napa is wine country, and you go up to the Sonoma Mission Inn in beautiful Napa, and I mean, you know, <laughs> it isn't the way it works. But Napa is that image, and as long as you're close enough to take advantage of it, uh, it it does add value to any brand out in the national market. But in direct to consumer, it it is a completely different analysis because in direct to consumer, they already know they're in Napa. What they really want to know is how you're different from everybody else in Napa. And how, what are those differences? What are some of the things you talk to your students about it, with respect to ways they can distinguish themselves 
in terms of direct to consumer? What's different between winery A and winery B as you go down the trail? Well, you, you, gosh, you're you're only asking me to condense eighteen. 18 weeks, 54 hours of lectures. Into two minutes. Into two, oh, I get two whole minutes for that one. Thank you, Jeff. Um, first of all, what consumers want in wine. It's interesting. Wineries believe that consumers want quality. But in fact, most consumers take quality for granted. Right. They assume if they're paying $20, $30, $40 dollars for a bottle of wine, it's a good bottle of wine. They don't need to be told it's really good. What they want is personality. And they want authenticity. They want to know there's a real person behind this brand. And they want a sense that this person is not just a corporate clone, not just someone who made $9 million or billion dollars uh, uh, pr producing paint on highways and now they want to own a winery. They want a sense that these people are real. They have quirks. They have personalities. And ironically, it's very difficult for a lot of people who own wineries to talk about that stuff. Why is that, David? Be is it because they've come from other businesses and they're new to this? Or oh. is it because they want to hide behind the winery? Well, some of it is they, particularly if you're very wealthy and you start a winery, a lot of wealthy people want a wall of separation between themselves and the general public for many, many reasons. Right. Um, an, another element, though, is I can't tell you the number of times I've had someone in my office say, you know, we want to have a really unique vision just like Robert Mondavi. And I always have to tell them, you know, unique means not like anything else. You can't be unique and like Robert Mondavi. You have to be unique in your own way. So what is your own way? And, of course, their own way is to act just like Robert Mondavi. Uh, <laughs> the only difference is Robert Mondavi spent 200 250 days a year on the road, traveling around, talking to people, building relationships, and telling his story to the American public. And these people many times want to sit inside their winery and have the public come to them and tell them how wonderful it is. And it doesn't work that way. Right. It's also a different time, obviously, a different Absolutely. year, and a different way people communicate. The, you know, the, the other part of it, it seems to me, is that there are so so much competition. Yes, yeah. Uh, there are a hundred and fifty thousand wines on in the U.S. market right now. Um, so imagine going to the new 49er stadium and then multiplying that times what four or five, uh, and that's how many individual wines there are for sale. And then marketing tells you your job is to stand out from the rest of them. And boy, that's hard work. And you really better be very strategic and you really better show a lot of energy because without those two things, it won't work. Now, one of the people who took my class the first or second year I taught it has done this brilliantly. And that's uh, Amelia Seja, who claims that I taught her everything she knows about marketing. But of course, when Amelia came up after class and said, I'd like you to work with me on the rest, on, on where we go with this winery, I took one look at her and said, Amelia, you understand this stuff so well, you don't need my help. Well, which, which goes to another point, and, and that is the degree that you can learn any of this. And, and I'll relate it to politics because it's, it's sort of hmm. easy rather than mentioning people <laughs> in, in the wine business. There are politicians that come along, people that come along, whether they're local or anyone, they just get it. Mm -hmm. You just see early on that they mm -hmm. have an ability. and uh, There's lots for them to learn if they're young, but they have an understanding of, of what works and how to tell a story and how to do this. And some don't. And no matter yeah. how much you, you teach them, they're never going to get it. Well, the, uh, the, the, the comparison to politics is a good one because ultimately marketing is building relationships with people. And that's absolutely what politics is. And you're absolutely right. There are people who are packaged candidates, but they don't actually have the ability to to speak to people and equally as important to tell let those people know that they're listening to them. And you meet the people who have those people skills and then have an interesting message to pitch, and they can sell wine for as long as they're around. You know, and you look at some of the brands that have sold recently for huge amounts of money, but Kent Rosenblum, Joel Peterson at Ravenswood, uh, these are people who spent their lifetimes traveling around the country talking to their customers about wine, and they built really powerful brands because of that. And Amelia Seja is doing the same right. thing. And then, of course, the other thing, you touched on this before, 
is the guy that made billions of dollars selling, to use your analogy, paint for the roadway. Right. And thinks that the same marketing technique that made him a billionaire is going to work selling wine. Not right. always the case. Not always the case. And the other side of that is that they absolutely believe that what they are making, you know, this is, this is one of the really, really difficult things to communicate to people about the, the wine industry. Um, there is in the industry what is known as the competitive set tasting where a winery that makes, let's just pick a brand, a $100 bottle of Napa Valley Cabernet goes out and buys 10 other bottles of $100 Napa Valley Cabernet and they taste them against each other and whichever one finishes up on top in this blind tasting is the winner. And I always look at that and I say, you know, that doesn't tell you anything at all because a consumer no consumer has ever walked into a wine shop and said, line up 10 bottles and I'll buy the one I like the best. That's not what they're buying. They're buying everything about that bottle except what it tastes like because they can't taste it. So the, the difference between Chateau Lafitte Rothschild at $1,000 a bottle and your wine that you've tasted against Chateau Lafitte Rothschild and think it's every bit as good as Chateau Lafitte Rothschild is, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild is Chateau Lafitte Rothschild and your Joe Schmo, or in this case, Jeff Shackman. It's interesting. It's a little bit like the cosmetics business, too. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. You're selling the image more than anything Absolutely. else. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, I mean, one of the wonderful things, the market research about this is fascinating. You know, there's a project down in Cal Poly where they, um, they, they literally – plugged electrodes into the pleasure centers of the consumers' brains because they wanted to test how those consumers reacted to wine. And, of course, they lied to the researchers, which is the only way that you can get really good researchers. If the researchers know what you're trying to prove, it'll always happen. Right. And so the researchers would hand people a glass, and here's a $10 bottle of Cabernet, and the pleasure waves on the, on the sine waves, you know, beautiful little pleasure waves coming out of the brain. And then they'd say, here's a $90 bottle of Cabernet, and the pleasure waves out of the brain off the charts right. before they touch the glass, Jeff. Right. So that's marketing. Marketing is having someone reach for that bottle in the store or reach for that glass in the restaurant and already have that deep sense of pleasure that they know they got something really good. And finally, how does that sit with your colleagues, you know, next door that are really focusing on how the wine is made and think that's the most important thing in the world. Well, I am absolutely delighted to say that the two primary colleagues I have, Paul Gospodarczyk in the enology side and Molly Hodgins in the viticultural side, both are very, very clear that what they do in the vineyard and in the winery is designed to make the best possible tasting wine in the bottle. And Napa Valley College Wines just got rated by right. Robert Parker 90, 91 points. I mean, these, are, these were, f for, a, for a community college, these were killer scores for those wines. Uh, but they also understand, because they've been in the business, they understand the number of really good wines throughout the market that don't sell because they haven't created that aura around them. And they understand that you can't have, if you want the whole package, you got to do it all. 23 years. How many more years you can do this? I haven't decided, but it's, you know, it's still fun. So why should I stop? There you go. Paul Wagner, <laughs> I thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure, Jeff. You're listening to NapaBroadcasting.com, Napa Valley Radio for the way we live now.